hear that? Got a new microphone. So apparently you guys like these uh, monitor videos, so I'm just going to gonna go through my whole collection. So uh, here's another one. This is the Digital VRC16. Um, I know you probably want me to shut my ass up and start with the montage, so I'll get to that in just a second. Next one after this is probably going to be the Dell P1110, and if I had to guess, that would come out uh, February 8th. That would be the second year anniversary of me getting that tube. So anyways, let's get to the fucking video. Right. What you just saw, my friends, was a 17-inch, 15.75-inch viewable. This thing is from the year 1991. It has a horizontal frequency from 30 to 75 kilohertz, vertical frequency from 50 to 90 hertz, although probably weighs 48 hertz in actuality. Uh, it's got a 0.26 millimeter dot pitch. Unclear if that's horizontal or diagonal. I doubt it's vertical, because um, that'd be weird. Uh, and yeah, weighs 49.6 pounds, or 22.5 kilograms, which is kind of insane for a monitor of this size. It's pretty overbuilt, and we'll go over that later as well. Did I mention the small-ass monitor was made in 1991? Oh yeah, and it's also got a, uh, a banging Toshiba tube that I will go nuts over later. So next, I'm going to bring your attention over to the internals of this monitor. So when I originally turned this thing on... It actually had vertical collapse. Uh, now, luckily, the monitor is overbuilt as hell, so it has some protection circuit built in. Because the actual line that was collapsed was not bright whatsoever. So, I didn't really have to worry about the screen getting burned in within five seconds. Uh, so, obviously, I, you know, I didn't keep it on. I took some photos that I'll show right here. But I did have to obviously open it up if I wanted to fix that, so we'll go into that right now. So being a uh, very expensive, overbuilt, high-end monitor, surprisingly uh, Taiwanese, from 1991, this thing was a pain in the ass to take apart, I swear to god. Look at this shit. I, um, so the amount of screws that I had by the end of it was just so overwhelming, and I surprisingly was able to put every single screw back in the correct place first try when assembling the monitor when I was, you know, done fixing the vertical collapse. Speaking of which, I prodded around um, on the deflection board, around the flyback and all that fun stuff, and um, luckily, I noticed the vertical IC, specifically the joints of the vertical IC, were, um, yeah. So, that was probably the issue, and um, I... I got to it, reflowed those joints, made them look good as new. Um, now, I, I don't recommend this, but I um, I assembled the monitor with the bare minimum like this. Yeah, probably not the smartest thing to do. Also, look at that fucking neck board, dude. I mean, it's not even the neck board. It's, um, it's like this weird board that is kind of mounted to a shield behind the neck board that goes onto the tube. Like the socket, so, but but yeah, don't turn a monitor on when it's in this state. I I don't know why I did that, but uh yeah, that uh that that fixed the issue. So, boom, bitch, boom, bitch, this fucker's working. So as I mentioned before, this monitor has a Toshiba tube, which is part of the reason why it looks so damn good and uh, vibrant. 
Now, this monitor was originally made in 1991, as I said. Now, unfortunately, Toshiba's microfilter was put into motion with the actual tubes um, in 1995, according to uh, this PDF right here that I got pulled up on the screen. So while it's four years off, um, you know, it's still a Toshiba tube. It's going to look good regardless of if it's a microfilter or not. Just thought I'd point that out. So it's not a microfilter tube. It's just a normal Toshiba tube. But it still looks good because Toshiba made some damn good looking tubes. Now it's time to dedicate an entire section of this video just to the controls on this monitor. You might have noticed that the bezel looks very clean, which is obviously because of the lack of, you know, controls being there. And saw that they're actually on the side, and the power button is a switch, and there's a knob, and what, what the fuck is going on? Well, it's probably my favorite part about the monitor, and it's also kind of frustrating when you're switching resolutions. We'll get into that, but yeah, it is it is the most attractive thing about this monitor, in my opinion. Besides the Toshiba tube, obviously. Time to look at some arousing controls. So this monitor has absolutely no OSD. It's from 1991 after all, so give it a couple more years and it would have had one. So we've just got straight buttons and dials to work with here. Now, before before we go to the buttons and, you know, the cool controls and all that, can we just appreciate how arousing the startup for this monitor is? Just, I'm, I'm going to turn the music off. I'm going to stop talking. Just, just admire this really quick. Damn, that shit is good. One more fucking time, dude. One more time. Oh, shit. Oh, man. Fuck, man. All right, let's talk about these controls. So a lot of the things that I'm going to be saying about the controls for this monitor are going to be paraphrased from the uh, service manual, which um, I will have on archive.org uh, as a link in the description. So if you want to prod around and take a look at it, feel free. First of all, the power switch, it's a little rocker instead of um, the standard push button that we see on pretty much everything. It's, it's, that's all there is to it. It's pretty cool. It's unusual. Um, there's the calibration push buttons, which are used in conjunction with the icon selector, which is the little rotating knob that you see with the horizontal size, position, vertical size, position, keystone, and uh, pin cushion. So those little up and down arrows are used to control the intensity of all of those options. And then, yeah, there's a little recall button. So you might be able to see it. It's It kind of looks like you can fit like a paperclip in there. And so that recalls the factory installed display settings for the current mode that you're running. So say you're on 480p, it'll reset it to default. And then you have the contrast knob and the brightness knob, which are little, they're little knobs that you can push in when you're not using, which I always found super cool about this set. So you don't have them poking out. So once you're done adjusting, you just pop it right back in it's a really simple and unique way of having controls on a crt like this and i feel like it actually adds to the design because it's just all put to the side and the bezel just looks so clean without all that stuff in the front it's something that i really do enjoy about this monitor but yeah, that thing with changing resolutions can be a little bit of a pain just because if you're, for example, going from 480p to 768p at 85 hertz, right? The issue that you're going to run into is that obviously you're going to adjust the geometry and the uh, picture to fit the bezels. But the thing is that you have these buttons on the side and you have to rotate each knob to the position, size, etc. And then you got to keep tapping the buttons. You can't hold the button down to just expand the screen you have to keep pressing for each increment so that can be a little tedious but besides that i don't mind it that much because on a monitor like this you're not really going to be making too many custom resolutions because of its frequency range so at the end of the day it's kind of just a little nitpick and also they didn't really design a monitor like this in mind with a dumbass making a billion resolutions and going back and forth between them so that's also something to consider when you're complaining about an issue such as that but yeah that's about it as far as the uh, controls go pretty cool stuff
All right, with all that out of the way, it's time for the uh, the content montage. I mean, that's it. It's a lot easier than the last time with the Siemens monitor because you don't have all this crazy shit that needs to be documented. With a monitor like this, it's pretty simple. Nothing too advanced like some software. It's literally just plug it in, cool controls, had a little bit of a thing to fix, cool looking tube. So uh, let's get to the content, man. That's, that's pretty much it.